This book is dedicated to all of the courageous who left their bliss at home now wrapped in clay, wandering in the valley of the shadows of death serving the dance in the garden of Samsara. And, of course, to the raw group, to the councils of Saturn and Andromeda, to the vast assembly of the Confederation of Planets, in service to the Infinite Creator. Introduction I began meeting extraterrestrials in 1965. Such encounters led to the creation of my Star People research in 1967 and the distribution of the questionnaire that has by now, in 1995, produced documentation of thousands of aliens living undetected on Earth. I find it ironic that for the past 40 years or more, some of our finest scientific minds have made a concerted effort to discover conclusive evidence of extraterrestrial life. The quest for alien intelligence has fired the imagination of every thinking person on planet Earth. Thousands of dedicated men and women have devoted their lives and their collective energies in an effort to answer that haunting question, is humankind alone in the universe? Thirty years ago I discovered to my satisfaction that alien intelligences do exist, and they have been living right here among us on Earth. Right now, all over the world, thousands of men and women are responding to some remarkable internal stimulus and remembering. What appear to be their own past lives on other worlds. It is as if some internal triggering mechanism is going off inside their psyches, thus producing profound memories that remind them that their true ancestral home is a very distant, a very alien, somewhere else. Right double quotation mark. In addition to past life memories of alien worlds, these people are also convinced that they came to Earth in their present life experience to perform a specific mission, and they seem often vibrant with an all-consuming conviction that they must do something to help humankind through the very difficult times that lie ahead for all the citizens of this planet. Some have received visions of Terry XL, black cataclysms, volcanisms, geological changes, the collapse of social structures, the toppling of political establishments, perhaps even the reversal of the planet's electromagnetic field or the shifting of its magnetic poles. I should at this point stress that the vast majority of the aliens whom I have met have been professionals who work in the helping vocations of our society. They have been registered nurses, medical doctors, psychologists, social workers, college professors, law enforcement officers, school teachers, psychic counselors, military personnel, chiropractors, and both male and female members of the clergy. Dr. Scott Mandelker has written this marvelously in-depth examination of these individuals who claim to have come from elsewhere, and he quotes speculation that there may be as many as 100 million of these sleeping aliens among us, yet to be awakened to their cosmic heritage. If there truly are such numbers of wanderers and walk-ins, the two groups of extraterrestrials on whom he focuses, then he is correct to name them a subculture in our contemporary society. Academically trained, Dr. Mandelker puts aside long-held intellectual prejudices and open-mindedly conducts interviews with these men and women of extraterrestrial consciousness and finds them to be sincere, mild, well-spoken, and tolerant, not at all flaky and wild-eyed. His interviewees generally hope to serve as catalysts for a global renaissance of spiritual values and greater awareness. In short, these strangers in a strange land are here to help. Scattered throughout the remarkable case histories in this book you will discover many speculations and theories. You will not find any final answers that will explain this global phenomenon, for, as Dr. Mandelker advises, it is up to us to make our own conclusions. There is no absolute proof of these claims, one way or the other. If, however, you make a sincere effort to approach this remarkable subject matter with the same tolerance and open-mindedness that Dr. Mandelker has exhibited, I can promise a most fascinating exploration of the farthest reaches of the human psyche. After such a fair appraisal, you are free to conclude along with a friend of one of his interviewees, I know you're not lying, but I don't necessarily believe you. On the other hand, perhaps you, too, will recognize that you are really from elsewhere. Right double quotation mark. To the sleeping wanderers from elsewhere origins. You are about to meet a group of people who hold one of the most radical beliefs in America today. Their lives are founded on what is, to say the least, a very unusual claim, an idea that is literally worlds away from mainstream society. Even with the mainstream becoming more progressive, this is still an obscure underground movement that is buried inside or, perhaps, on the fringe of New Age culture. It's vaguely popularized, sometimes glamorized, but, in fact, this is a real and vibrant subculture of those who believe themselves to be of non-earthly origins, they are extraterrestrials. There may be as many as 100 million extraterrestrials, e. 
T. S. currently living on Earth. Most of them are what could be called sleeping wanderers. Please understand that I'm not talking about people who claim UFO abductions or other forms of contact with strange beings from someplace beyond our planet. Our story here is a close encounter with individuals who go about their day-to-day -day earthly lives centered on the claim that they are the visitors. I use the term wanderers to describe those e. t. souls who have been extraterrestrial since birth, but who've forgotten who they are and live under a kind of veil of their true being, and then a slowly, if they're fortunate, begin to awaken. As for the number of sleeping wanderers, that was arrived at like this, on January 28, 1981, in the twelfth session of channeled information from an E. T. group known as Ra, it was stated that there were approximately 65 million wanderers on Earth, a lot more information on the Ra contact is given in Appendix 3. If we calculate further, we can assume the number is much higher today, almost 15 years later amidst an ongoing influx of souls coming to help the transition into the new age. If we estimate, the figure can be revised to a current population of about 100 million, probably one of the strangest secrets of the universe. More strange, it is a very human story. It may seem odd to you that there could be a kind of higher level for these individuals, but it's undeniably true that they experience ordinary emotions of joy, sorrow, hope, and discouragement. Just like other human beings. The vast majority of these people, not the children, but the adults, have no idea of their own origins and probably only recognize some of the consequences of being a stranger in a strange land. Those I interviewed for this book, those who've traveled from confused alienation to self-conscious E. T. Identity, represent only a tiny fraction of the E. T. Population. Most of these veiled E. T. Wanderers never connect their deep sense of being different with the fact of being from elsewhere, so I call them sleeping wanderers. And to a large extent, this book is written for them. Not in their memory but for their memory, to jog, jostle, and jar loose those dim recollections of an extraterrestrial past. Some of these sleeping wanderers, those who've been asleep the longest, are actually the most skeptical and disbelieving about extraterrestrial existence. After centuries of disillusionment, Adrift in the confusion of materialistic human life, they're often bitter and mistrustful of utopian or idealistic pronouncements, so the idea that compassionate e. t. souls might arrive on Earth from elsewhere to aid in time of crisis seems completely ridiculous. If you find yourself fascinated with UFO e. t. life, yet intensely skeptical, perhaps you are also one of these doubting wanderers. Right double quotation mark. Well, then. How can we recognize these hidden e? T. S. How do we begin to understand those who take human form to assist the planet but forget who they are and how they came to be here? During that January 1981 channeling session, when Don Elkins asked Ra about the kinds of problems these wanderers usually face, Ra responded that they have as a general rule some form of handicap, difficulty or feeling of alienation which is severe. The most common of these difficulties are alienation, the reaction against the planetary vibration by personality disorders, as you would call them, and body complex ailments indicating difficulty in adjustment to the planetary vibrations. Italics added, the implications, I think, are tremendous. This is not to assume that every mental patient, every person in long-term therapy, or anyone with hay fever is actually an E. T. Comma, but I do believe that some of them are. I believe that rather than viewing a sense of being from elsewhere as a sign of mental disorder, it's possible that in some cases the disorder itself is brought on by the terrible effort of an E. T. Trying to adjust to the vibrations and patterns of Earth. I will say this, I firmly believe that some of the so-called insane, and some of the chronic mentally ill, are actually from elsewhere and that they are battling a world in which their very presence is denied, derided, and labeled as just plain crazy. How many people feel an intense alienation that doesn't go away? How many people feel different throughout their lives and never really fit in? How many people go through life with chronic problems of allergies or other ailments of maladjustment to the physical environment? There must be millions. Maybe 100 million. Before coming to any conclusions, I want to make it clear that I am not saying everyone is an extraterrestrial. What I am saying is that conventional medical theories with their pronouncements that alienation is purely a psychological problem or a personality disorder due to childhood trauma, are just one perspective, an Earth-based view. There is another way to look at these problems, and I believe that for some people, that way will go much farther. As an explanation, 
For some, it may turn their lives around. Psychology, of course, is a useful tool that can definitely help people understand themselves and learn to release negative emotional patterns. I tremendously value the communication skills I learned along the way to a master's degree in counseling. They are something I could not have picked up in the Buddhist monasteries where I've also spent some time. Therapy, for humans worry. T. S. can be a potent force for change and healthy growth, for individuals, couples, and families. But modern psychology does not explain everything. The problems come about when psychologists or psychiatrists begin to believe that their model of the mind, a very Western one, is the only true model. They believe that the human self stretches from head to toes, that life and death are opposites, that genetics and social conditioning are the greatest forces shaping personality. Unfortunately, this model of how the mind works labors under the same limitations that cripple their model of the universe. It's why so many clinical therapists spend so much time trying to understand how UFO crop circles, e. t. sightings, alien abductions, esp, telepathy, and out-of-body experiences are all psychological events. The lengths to which therapists go in explaining such paranormal experiences as psychological are often absurd. Some of their expert opinions include that bodily scars and apparent radiation nausea from claimed alien abductions are just leakage from the collective unconscious that the dozens of geometrically precise crop circles, in dozens of nations, were all created by localized windstorms or pranksters, and that out-of-body experiences are really just the vivid hallucinations of those born with fantasy-prone personalities. The literature of this school of thought brings up subjects like anomalous trauma syndrome or sleep paralysis, both of which have been given some attention recently in the press. We'll certainly talk about these things in a later chapter, but, for now, it's much more helpful to keep in mind that psychological definitions, no matter how exact, are only one way of seeing it. They are not the only perspective. Human denial and fear of the unknown are immense and often hide behind the mask of authority. It might be interesting one day to read a psychological study of those psychologizers, those researchers, who've arrived at such presentable, westernized conclusions. Because there is much that does not compute in the rational, materialist worldview which is the basis of our Western civilization and, now, our global culture, how can we be surprised when the experts scramble for psychological explanations of everything mystical and non-ordinary? Lest you think that e. t. souls are always on the margins of society, bear in mind that several channeling contacts have identified Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson as wanderers who incarnated for the purpose of guiding the newborn United States. I believe that, whether or not they understand their veiled personality, many e. T. S. are in positions of power around the world, and that some of them are seeking to foster international peace, justice, economic parity, and environmental protection. Many work in the medical professions, a natural venue for serving others, as well as in the fields of psychology, education, and citizen advocacy. Wherever there is the potential for uplifting the human condition, there the E. T. S. known as wanderers will be found although few of them have really pursued their spiritual aptitudes, and fewer still would even consider the idea of being from elsewhere. So, I like to think of this book as a journey of exploration. The territory that we'll explore isn't on land or sea or even in outer space. Really, it's more a trip through a very different way of being, a much more universal way of being. And the best method of transportation is the willingness to keep an open mind. If our minds and hearts are open, all sorts of insights can come to us. The presence of E. T. S. has rarely been given any real analysis or serious research. The experience of E. T. Identity has rarely been addressed and often gets lost in a medley of strange and fascinating tales. The personal conflicts, the struggles and accomplishments of those with non-earthly origins, their transition from confusion to confidence, all of that has been given far too little attention by academics or the mainstream public. But that's what we'll do here through case studies and the stories of those who are actually living this radical identity. We'll take a look at the experience of being a T in America. And I think things are changing. Recently I met a Los Angeles video producer who confided in me that he'd had a powerful UFO experience several years back and could definitely accept the idea that some people are a T S. He even once had a girlfriend who said she was an extraterrestrial. I'm friendly with a mild-mannered limousine driver who also had UFO experiences in his youth and has no problem with the idea that he is from another world. Like many of those I interviewed for this book, 
he didn't see his off-planet origins as anything particularly strange. I also met the assistant of a famous Parisian clothing designer who, upon hearing my ideas about E. T. S. and Wanderers, rushed out to buy the raw material, Roz channeled statements, in the middle of a San Francisco business trip. He, too, had had UFO experiences and feels very different from his earthly associates in the glamorous world of high fashion. I'm trained as an academic and, in conducting my research, have relied on the methods and techniques of cultural anthropology. In the words of the famous anthropologist Kronisla Malinowski, I've tried to grasp the native's point of view, his relation to life, to realize his vision of his world. Please do realize that I also mean her. Vision of her world. Comma. We're going to take the phrase vision of his world literally here, which means we'll include other planets, as well. We'll try not to cling to a particular nation or a particular culture. The key to our process of understanding has to be a solid respect for the differentness of these natives, and I've always tried to honor this differentness. Otherwise, how can we really know these people? If we don't, at least for a little while, surrender our fixed ideas and preconceptions, our globocentric Earth human views? Most important, this book is not an attempt to prove or disprove anyone's experience. The question of proof, is it fact or is it fantasy, might well be the bottom line of this entire discussion, but it's imperative to keep in mind that there's no conclusive, final evidence available on either side. None. So, at the very heart of our story, we're really discussing this, how the recognition of being a T has influenced and determined the quality of these particular lives. In the case of our e, T. S. What has led them to recognize that they are from elsewhere? Exactly what happens after the realization that one is extraterrestrial? What is the meaning of this sense of identity? And what about all of the people who are also from elsewhere but don't know it? In this book I've allowed the E. T. S. to speak for themselves. My field research lasted several years and took me to both the from elsewhere, east and west coasts as well as to the southwestern part of the United States. It involved more than 25 subjects. A wide range, some lived fairly standard lives and some conducted themselves in a more unusual manner. There were individuals who held everyday jobs, those who held no jobs at all, and those who ran E. T. Support groups, lectured in New Age ideas, and counseled others. Some, as we've said, regarded themselves as wanderers, a term. That applies to those who are in fact E. T. Souls from birth and only gradually come to realize their identity. Others defined themselves as walk-ins and had lived through a dramatic, sudden, soul exchange at some point later in life. I enjoyed interviewing and getting to know these people. Far from being flaky, naive faddists, the majority of them were serious, reasonable in thought and speech, and not particularly bedazzled by beliefs of being from elsewhere. They were anything but fanatics. They were generally mild and well-spoken, gentle and peaceable far more accepting and tolerant than many leaders and followers of conventional religious groups. Only a very few seemed to want converts to their ideas, and fewer still thought they were glorious heralds of the New Age or some type of superior being deigning to serve poor, miserable earthworms. Having made peace with an unorthodox identity and having then faced the consequences, most of them no longer craved acceptance from the social mainstream. They only wished to go their own way unmolested and take care of their worldly work as necessary and their worldly work was invariably service to the planet and the people around them. My research was originally carried out to earn a doctorate in East-West Psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. I already had a master's in counseling psychology, had several years of private practice under my belt, and had done a good bit of lecturing on a variety of spiritual topics. Since I am, myself, not a newcomer to New Age beliefs, a final word about my own personal views and my personal experience would not be inappropriate here, I personally believe that such a phenomenon as individual souls originating on other planets, or in other dimensions and incarnating on Earth for particular purposes is ontologically possible, possible as a fact, in other words, rather than valid only for believers. I deeply believe that our universe does work this way. I have always believed that some people can be clearly aware of this for themselves, though they may not be able to either prove it to anyone else or even convincingly argue its metaphysics. Being a poor arguer doesn't mean the phenomenon one believes cannot be true. I also recognize that others, making the exact same claims, might be speaking from a mixture of imagination and hope, memories of reading and of film. Some may even be suffering a psychotic disorganization, although I have found this to be quite unusual. 
only a rare person, I think, will have an undistorted perception and recognition of his or her specific other planetary origins, or specific mission here on Earth. Clearly, to retrieve this type of detailed information requires unusual intellectual and extrasensory ability. But I believe that all of these strange ideas can indeed be verified by one whose awareness is clear, mature, and spiritually attuned. This, also, may not be proven to others. You, now reading these words, may yourself believe that accounts of very transformative types of benevolent e. t. contacts are really something of an interdimensional wake-up call for wanderers. This means that if you've had a UFO or out-of-body experience yourself, one that changed your life forever, giving you renewed hope, vision, faith, and meaning, or at least increased your spiritual seeking, then you may very well be a wanderer. There is no way to be sure. In the end, it is up to you to realize what feels right, not according to your changing moods and emotions, the usual motive feeling, but, instead, according to a deep, inner knowing that takes time to gel and may well create conflicts and challenges to your current lifestyle. In this way, the realization of being from elsewhere may feel right but not necessarily make you feel happy, and certainly not put an end to all of your problems. I do know that E.T. Souls are found in every walk of life. Some are successful and effective in Earth's terms while others make do with the ordinary mixture of joy and sorrow. There are still others who are truly on the fringe, severely handicapped in their interpersonal relations, and even some who are institutionalized. And one more thing. I, too, have had many of the same experiences as the so-called wanderers in my study. During a period of almost two decades, I have traveled much the same route as they, going ever deeper into the question of identity. For me, it's been a journey with many stops along the way, mainstream psychotherapy, serious involvement with Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, and Taoism, five years of intensive meditation in monasteries in the United States, India, and Thailand, training as an academic, studies in theosophy, the tarot, palmistry, the I Ching, New Age counseling, channeling, and experiences with hemispheric synchronization, a high-tech method of synchronizing the vibratory modes of the two brain hemispheres that is meant to lead directly to higher consciousness. So you see, I, too, have been around the block, and maybe around the universe. Dot. Finally, through the careful piecing together of leads and pointers I, too, have arrived at the conclusion that I am from elsewhere. And I've spent many years dealing with the ramifications and consequences of that discovery all your life you've felt different from everyone around you. Sometimes you thought you were special, then again, sometimes you worried you were weird, certainly out of place. You really didn't fit in. Even with your family, or your closest friends, you were never completely at home. There were troubling moments when you dared to imagine that you weren't actually the child of your parents. Maybe you felt isolated, walled off in a loneliness that didn't make sense. And whether you spent most of your time by yourself or you were the most popular person around, there was always this insistent feeling, somehow, in some strange way, I'm not like an Aeneas I know of course, all this might be perfectly normal. That's what a lot of people said. Everybody feels this way, don't worry about it. Or, they offered you an acceptable, rational, normal explanation. It's just part of growing up, is what they said. Probably you pretended to believe them. But even after you agreed and dutifully said yes to one of those 11 normal explanations, whether framed as psychology, conservative religion, or plain common sense, you secretly knew their answers really answered nothing. Too many pieces of your personal puzzle still hadn't yet been found. Your life was a painful, confusing mystery that just didn't make any sense. So, without telling anyone, you pushed ahead. It became an intense, profound search, the struggle to answer the question of who you are. And even if you didn't know the object of your quest, you were definitely a seeker. There was no shortage of mysteries. Why did certain sites, say, something like the illustration of a futuristic crystal city in a children's book, suddenly set off strange feelings of inner knowing and the sharp pain of homesickness? Or, seemingly without reason, why did you become altogether perplexed by human anatomy? What had you believing for a moment that something about the people around you was just totally wrong? What was it? What was this all about? Vague memories kept floating beneath the surface of your mind, which, incredibly, seemed to recall your life, but in another kind of civilization. Was that really my life? Then, sometimes your sleep was filled with striking, vivid dreams in which you witnessed magnificent visions, heard voices offering instruction, traveled through time and space, or felt flooded with feelings of love and assurance. It felt familiar. It felt wonderful. 
Finally, something happened. Gradually, or with shocking swiftness, an answer was presented. Maybe it seemed startling, ridiculous, or even unbelievable. Or maybe you were well prepared, and you weren't even surprised when everything clicked. But with all that you had, every sinew, you were certain it was the only solution you could accept. Soren's story. The most common E. T. Experience usually begins with exactly this kind of intensive yearning, a dramatic search for meaning and personal identity. In my many interviews with those who recognized themselves as being from elsewhere, these feelings were the most common starting point. It was because of a sense of profound, inexplicable differentness that most people were driven to find the truth of who they really were. There were some notable exceptions, of course. But the following story, the story of Soren, is an excellent example of how someone lived through a long, dark night of the soul before accepting a non-earthly persona and thus becoming completely transformed. When I first met Soren, I could have been easily convinced that he was a Southern California surfer which, in fact, he actually had been. A tall bearded blonde man in his mid-thirties with piercing blue eyes, he sometimes gets mistaken for the actor Patrick Swayze, and nobody would mistake him for a strange little green being from outer space. But Soren was a San Francisco hospital technician who, after what he terms a turbulent path of awakening, finally became completely clear that he did not come from Earth, that he was actually an extraterrestrial. As a child, Soren told me, he was always troubled by terribly profound feelings of being different. In school, he had almost no close friendships and, instead, spent much of his time scribbling notes to the Martians while, in class, he incessantly drew spaceships. But it wasn't his own artwork that gave Soren that first shock of recognition, it was an imaginative rendering done by somebody else. Soren was in the second grade. He was paging through a school reader, when he came upon an illustration of a crystal city. Staring down at the book, unable to turn away, Soren remembers being seized by an achingly painful sensation of homesickness. He almost burst into tears. He was far too young to understand his own reactions, but in the days that followed, Soren felt compelled to include a crude, childlike copies of this crystal city as the backdrop to each of his pictures of spaceships. In school Soren suffered under the classic regime for developing psychological repression and self-rejection. As the sci-fi drawings began to cover every piece of paper in his possession, he was harshly reprimanded by his teacher, who told him never to make such drawings again. Nip the eccentric obsession in the bud, was her idea. She never wondered why this child was so obsessed. Soren's parents, however, saw nothing wrong with his behavior. They found it very down-to-earth, maybe the result of a short attention span mixed with a vibrant imagination of childhood. They were kind to their son and supported his experience. Despite their concern, however, nothing changed, the boy was still alone with his feelings of isolation. Soren almost never spoke to his parents about being different, and he neglected to mention something else that was going on, regular, nightly travels with people he called my friends, travels in which Soren seemed to leave his body, board some kind of transport craft, and fly off to visit people on Earth or elsewhere. Finding a little comfort even with his good-natured parents, Soren told me that he was left with only one listener for these stories, his stuffed puppy. Soren was a lonely child and grew into a detached and alienated teenager. Adolescence was a particularly bad time for Soren. In his teenage years he found it impossible to believe that life had any value at all. He felt misunderstood and split off from everyone around him. And it was as a teenager, he told me, that his serious quest for his true self began, one which stretched through shelves of books on philosophy, psychology, and the fiction of those who were searchers like himself. Soren was, he says, disillusioned and in a flat, colorless, two-dimensional world. He was deeply dissatisfied with what the world offered him. Between the ages of 18 and 20 Soren's dislocation became so bitter and painful that he began the heavy use of drugs. Finally, he attempted suicide by overdose. When that failed the first time he tried again. Then, he OD'd once more. What he had was really a death wish fueled by the desire to escape intense psychic suffering. Soren was hospitalized. And one night, while he was in a psychiatric ward recovering from his third attempt to take his own life, Soren lived through what he describes as a series of vivid out-of-body experiences, obs. These are not at all unusual for those who finally recognize themselves as E. T. S. For Soren, this was the turning point. And the most striking of the experiences was this one. He floated away until he was able to see an omniscient vision of the entire Earth from space. But he was not by himself. 
suspended and drifting away from the globe, Soren felt he was with a group of non-physical beings and that strangely, he felt an unearthly camaraderie with them. He knew himself to be a part of this group. And in his mind he heard the phrase, we are gathering. With a flash of intuitive knowledge, Soren knew this was a reflection of the true communion between all extraterrestrials on Earth and that the purpose of E.T. Visitation was to serve this planet during a time of transition. He understood he was an integral part of this gathering group. But this experience, so lucid and affirming, was only one step in a gradual awakening. It didn't immediately transport Soren to the conclusion that he was from elsewhere, but the reality was so strongly felt and so convincing that he was driven to collect more information. It was as if he was determined to make sense of this puzzling experience. Sometimes I refer to these kinds of events as dropped seeds of mystery, because in many of those I interviewed, they frequently inspired an intense spiritual search. Soren began reading. Ruth Montgomery, The Books of Brad Steiger, Everything and Anything That Dealt with UFOs, E. T. S., and Out of Body Experience. Finally, Soren picked up the raw material, see Appendix 3, and experienced a sudden snap when everything finally made sense. Soren arrived at this conclusion, it was possible, he believed, to come from an actual civilization outside of Earth, not simply a vague metaphysical realm, as he had previously imagined. Life beyond Earth did not mean a formless floating in the ethers as he had thought before. Soren began to look for others who claimed a similar experience. This became his path the question that immediately presents itself here is obvious. Could Soren have taken a more conventional, earthly approach? Could he have sought out orthodox counseling to help explain his ordinary feelings? Of course. In fact, to hear him speak, Soren seems quite psychologically sophisticated, more so than most people I've met. Aside from extensive personal therapy, he was enrolled for a several years in a master's program in counseling and psychology. He really did seek a second opinion. He felt terribly guilty for what sometimes seemed like a personal failure. He couldn't follow conventional ways and he couldn't fit in. Still, earthbound descriptions sounded to him like music being played off key, tinny and unconvincing. Soren constantly felt a certain under the surface uneasiness that comes from trying to fit yourself into the wrong place. Pushed on by what he told me was a sense of deeply knowing something that he couldn't articulate but had to express, slowly, over a period of years, Soren was able to make the jagged pieces of his life blend together smoothly like the colors of a well composed painting. Of course, it took him many years to integrate all the implications of being an E.T. on Earth. And this work continues today. The study of New Age material, he cautions, only helped clear the fog, but the core feeling of who I was, was always present and unchanged. His outer study only confirmed what he knew deep inside, but had lacked the framework to explain. Being an E.T. comma, Soren says, is now more real than the body around me. Right double quotation mark. Wanderers and walk-ins. Soren is what is known as a wanderer. Briefly, in the T. Literature, there are two main types of extraterrestrials, wanderers and walk-ins. These are not the kind of E. T. S. who come walking down the ramp of a Hollywood-style UFO. They are, instead, extraterrestrials who incarnate on Earth. Wanderers are E. T. S. right from the beginning, although they're born of human parents, just like the rest of us. Their awakening almost always comes gradually and follows a long period of loneliness and severe alienation. And, although this transformation dawns slowly, afterward any deep desperation is lifted. And it seems like the final link in a long chain has finally appeared. Wanderers often feel as though they're discovering something they've actually always known, a new vision of a very old truth. Some of the wanderers describe the process in terms of an unveiling as they learn to accept the identity of a person living on Earth who has non-human origins. As you might guess, this can be very difficult. The term wanderer appears in a number of popular books on the subject. The raw material, see Appendix 3, one of the more sophisticated authorities on E.T. Related spiritual matters, speaks of wanderers at length. A wanderer is defined as any E.T. who while coming from another world, is as ordinary as anyone else in mind and body after birth. Only with extensive spiritual effort can they realize their true identity, that they are E.T. Souls. Most important, a wanderer is an E.T. who volunteers to incarnate on a planet with the desire to help those who are evolving there. Because of this unusual privilege, 
to incarnate directly on a planet in which service is eagerly needed, a planet which needs a lot of help. Comma, the Wanderer agrees to forget his or her e. T. Identity and renounce what might be thought of as the magical powers that were enjoyed back home. Therefore, it's very common for wanderers to get ensnared in earthly ways. In fact, it is quite difficult for them not to get entangled since there are oh so many snares, and part of their hope is just to fit in, for purposes of both service and their own peace of mind. In most cases, the amnesia lasts a lifetime, or many lifetimes. That. For some, however, there's a germ of discontent and bit by bit they work back toward an understanding of their origins. This is considered piercing the veil. These are the people I interviewed. The journey they embark upon can alleviate a great deal of personal pain and fill the void of meaninglessness that they often feel. The search for self-understanding brings order to their lives and resolves the mystery of their chronic differentness. Soren's story epitomizes this process. Acute crisis, however, is almost always the experience of the other type of E. T. Comma, the walk-in. Actually, walk-in is a very accurate term. It indicates that an entity, E. T. Or otherwise, although in my study I only interviewed E. T. Souls, has done just that, walked into a person's body and mind with shocking suddenness. Or, as some describe it, it's as though one experiences a wrenching and unexpected soul exchange or soul transfer. Please bear in mind this has nothing to do with spirit possession or obsessing entities. It is considered a completely voluntary process. The term walk-in was introduced to the general public by Ruth Montgomery in her 1979 book Strangers Among Us. She defined a walk-in as, a high-minded entity who is permitted to take over the body of another human being who wishes to depart. The motivation for a walk-in is humanitarian. He or she, first completes the tasks of the body's previous owner, and then goes on to do what he must do on his own projects. For walk-ins, there is a new birth, and indeed, I found that their stories were filled with images of death and rebirth. Their awakening is almost always abrupt, tinged with trauma, and, understandably, their metamorphosis is usually felt as some kind of catastrophic life event. What could be more disruptive than exchanging your very soul for another? And what could be more confusing than feeling yourself a fresh, vibrant soul that must labor with negative psychological habits? The story of Bob's awakening is a case in point. Bob's story. Bob's story provides a good illustration of the walk-in phenomenon because Bob is a man who started out with no interest in anything spiritual, metaphysical, or psychological, couldn't have cared less about E. T. S. and, in fact, told me that Hustler magazine had been his prime idea of solid reading. Today, in his late thirties, Bob is still an ungainly, overweight man with unkempt dark hair. On the day I saw him, he needed a shave. For years he's drifted from job to job, and when I spoke to him he was unemployed. At 13, Bob says, he began using narcotics, and by the time he was in his twenties he was using not by the day but by the moment. From the moment I awoke in the morning to the moment I went to bed at night. Bob describes himself at the time as a real rager who was often violent and abusive and enjoyed cruelly manipulating other people. Put simply, he was not a nice guy. Yet that all changed over a period of several months when Bob was 37 years old. Comma, at the time, he was a regular at Narcotics Anonymous. One night, returning from a meeting, in what Bob thinks of as a telepathic impulse, he heard himself being told to go to the nearby library and begin reading metaphysical literature. And so he did. There followed, in fact, many visits to the library. And after one of these trips, while he was with a friend, Bob went through the cataclysmic paranormal experience that changed his life. The details of the event are humble enough, but the impact it had was profound. It happened at a table in a local coffee shop when Bob was talking with a buddy. Bob had brought along a book he'd just taken from the library and placed it in his friend's shoulder bag. During lunch, when he reached to get it, bizarrely, the book had simply disappeared. There was no human explanation for how it had vanished. Bob says that when he realized the book was gone, and that he knew beyond a doubt he'd placed it there only a few moments before, he shifted into a kind of hallucinogenic haze, started moaning, then heaving emotionally, and shaking with uncontrolled sobs. Years of pain and torment rushed out of him like the torrent from a huge dam whose walls have split and shattered. Across a page of his friend's newspaper, there appeared a strange sentence that seemed to float superimposed, as in a waking vision. The sentence read, You have paid the toll. You can cross the bridge. Bob didn't know then that all the suffering of his previous years was finally extinguished, the debt 
the toll had at last been paid and he was now free to cross over into a much happier life. Which is exactly what happened over the next four days, Bob says, he experienced feelings, energies, and an intense psychic sensitivity that he'd never known before and certainly never would have believed existed. Remember, this was a man with a near zero interest in spiritual matters. During that time, however, Bob felt graced with precognitive and telepathic powers, and he says it was like an electrical charge going through his body, a force so powerful that he could survive. On two hours of sleep per night, he was filled with energy. Along with that, Bob was overcome by emotions that had previously seemed reserved for others, intense surges of joy, peace, and tenderness. He also felt filled with love. Bob described this to me as a soul transfer, although he's not completely sure that's what really happened. He says from that moment, he ended 24 years of chronic drug abuse and has not touched any narcotics since, a fact. Which, alone, was amazing enough for me. As for his current identity, he admits that some of the old patterns are still present but says it's like Bob is still here, the memory is here, but it doesn't feel like Bob. This is a fundamental confusion that all of the Walkins must overcome. His final conclusion provided no great comfort, I am Bob. And I am not Bob far away from close encounters. Obviously, Bob's tale of awakening didn't require a dramatic UFO abduction, or an encounter with willowy green beings, or the prodigious imagination of Steven Spielberg. Which brings us to some major differences between the E. T. S. involved in my study and the other Earth people who say they've made contact with spacefaring visitors. Interestingly enough, the group of people I interviewed did not consider the UFO controversy to be a subject that had any direct bearing on their experience. Most of the walk-ins and wanderers I met were uninterested in such debate. They felt no need to prove or argue the reality of UFOs to earthbound skeptics and, while they were familiar with stories of government cover-ups, weren't very concerned about that, either. Instead, they usually spoke of what they were living through in terms of non-physical beings, greater awareness, transcendence, spirituality, or information received or channeled from some kind of higher consciousness, be it master, spirit guide, or e. t. group. From time to time, though, I did encounter stories of visitation, but these meetings were usually like this one, reported by a 35-year-old architect I'll call Peter. Peter told me that at a crucial time in his life he was repeatedly visited by an intelligent, sentient ball of light that entered his room and eventually led him to what he called a sense of spiritual fortification. This odd event followed a period of severe depression in college when Peter was using meditation to heal his psychic pain. Actually, he confessed that he had wanted to meditate to die, hoping to escape his body and be free of his terrible existential suffering. In this way, he was very much like Soren, who also wanted to end his life. What saved Peter, however, were those many visits by a hovering ball of light, which were completely unexpected and almost immediately eased his depression. It was as if a strong dose of mystery recharged his will to live and conveyed the fact that he was not really alone. Even so, there was no sudden personality shift. Peter did not immediately become a more spiritual or integrated person. He still felt detached and on the margins of social life. Personal integration, as is usually the case, took many years of inner work, and Peter says it was not until he was introduced to the idea of a walk-in that he was able to finish piecing together the puzzle. With other leads and pointers, the information he received about walk-ins helped him make sense of his experiences. It also explained some of the gradual personality shifts and new ways of thinking that led him to become a more universal citizen. A visitation, when it occurs, is more likely to happen as a dream experience. That's another major difference between wanderers and walk-ins and those who are involved with strictly physical UFO encounters. For wanderers and walk-ins, remember, there is generally no attempt to prove the common everyday, external, physical reality of spacecraft. Other planetary ships and beings, however, quite often make visits and dreams, and those who claim E. T. Identity very openly told me that dreams are a perfectly valid means of E. T. Contact and experience. In fact, dreams are considered to be one of the primary ways that benevolent E. T. S. awaken sleeping wanderers to their cosmic heritage. And this is just what happened to Vicky. She's a therapist and body worker in her 30s who went through the most gradual, gentle awakening of anyone I interviewed. Vicky very sweetly described how she had felt no doubt, trauma, or confusion about being an E. T. wanderer, and summed it up neatly, it was no big deal. 
right double quotation mark. Fifteen years ago, she had a series of extremely lucid dreams involving spaceships, extraterrestrials, and different worlds. And, as is often the case, she was filled with a realization of being at one with the E.T.S. of having a strongly felt common bond. It was not that she was so happy to meet them, but, rather, she was happy to realize that she, too, was one of them. Their group was, in fact, also her own. It was a feeling of belonging to a single community. Together. Being from elsewhere, she now says, does not necessarily mean coming from any one, static location. So today, Vicky will speak easily about a long personal history of interplanetary travel, reincarnation, and an extensive relationship with a UFO confederation called the Ashtar Command. The name Ashtar refers to the leader of this pan e. T. Group and many New Age books and communiques are attributed to this commander. But again, remember, to understand the experience of wanderers and walk-ins, it's important to make certain that our language and theirs share some common meaning, which is more difficult than it appears, given what's being described. Don't forget that concepts can sometimes be as fluid as water. Also, it helps to move away from those prepackaged images too easily recalled from old Hollywood sci-fi movies, or from explanations that are designed only to discover assumed psychological problems and a failure to socially adjust. The people I interviewed were neither cosmic freaks nor convoluted neurotics. If you spoke with them on non-spiritual matters you'd never know they considered themselves e. t. souls. In many, many ways, they are quite ordinary. Some e. t. s. who speak of the Ashtar Command, for instance, say it's contacted through vivid dreams, psychophysical experiences, and channeled information. Some of them never speak about UFO ships or mystical ideas at all and the sense of self that might be summed up as I am an E.T. from another planet and might give rise to delusions of self-importance, represents only one type of extraterrestrial identity. Some of the wanderers and walk-ins I met, like Vicky, consider their cosmic origins with a great deal of humility. Others stay away from any kind of self-definition and, instead, stress a sense of divine union. Rather than featuring UFO landings and high-tech spacemen, most of their awakenings to the idea of being a T. Are deeply emotional, personal experiences that are often paranormal and mystical. Whatever the quality of these events, however, they totally reconstruct a person's way of being and lead to wide, sweeping changes in every aspect of life. Kristen's story When trouble entered Kristen's life, it came not with a whimper but a bang. A gay man nearing 40, he was going through a terrible time. With his live-in partner who was thinking about leaving him. Then there was trouble in his career as a teacher and administrator and that was followed by financial problems. Finally, Kristen was feeling six of the twelve most common symptoms of HIV infection. His life was taking a nosedive and plummeting fast. Certain that he was going to die, Kristen began to pray every day for relief. When there was none, he started to toy with the idea of suicide. A therapist friend tried to convince Kristen to take control of his life and reminded him of his relation to God, which, Kristen says, lifted his depression for brief bursts of life passion. He'd go for walks, stroll at night to look at the stars, go mountain climbing. But the depression would always return like a thick, dark storm cloud. Without warning, Kristen says, he began hearing what he describes as inner voices. He was given commands. He would be ordered to drive to a particularly beautiful area near his home and contemplate the scenery or told to sit in meditation. None of the demands were weird or scary, all of them were quite uplifting. Even so, depression weighed on him still. Finally, while sitting with friends one night in a restaurant, Kristen was seized with the strangest of pains and a temporary mental paralysis, like two or three things were trying to come into me at the same time. He felt like a radio tuned to three stations all at once. In his mind, piercing through the static, he heard the phrase, remember this moment. After that, he became terrified, the pain and paralysis became so great that he doubled over, cried out and was certain he was dying. Friends rushed him to a local hospital, and on the way Kristen began to say his goodbyes. He was not surprised about being so close to the end it was then that he received yet another inner message. This time, he was simply told to go home, just go home now. Then and there, in the rushing ambulance, Kristen says, he experienced an out-of-body state that he can only define as an eternal peace and stillness. For one full minute, he ceased breathing. He felt he was being presented with the choice of whether to live or die. At this point, the voice said to Kristen in an almost paternal way, 
If you want to live, you have to breathe. He took the advice. He really did want to live. For several months afterward, Kristen told me, he regularly heard in his mind the words, I have given you a new spirit. He felt a profound sense of having died and been reborn. And since that time, every aspect of his life has taken root and blossomed. That was eight years ago. With the help of friends and support groups, reading and meditation, Kristen has come to terms with his non-ordinary identity as a walk-in. This awakening, he says, has led him to a life of kindness, grace, love, and passion. He feels imbued with psychophysical energies of a seemingly intelligent design, energies that have healed him and infused his life with an enviable zest for living. Today, Kristen works in a worldwide service organization and counsels others who have been dealing with similar issues. He has counseled over 300 people, is a beloved member of his community, and presents a completely successful tale of walk and awakening. I'll return to his unique story later. When I count to three, you will remember everything Betty, at the age of 62, is the oldest person I interviewed. She presents the charming picture of a proper, storybook English lady, with long, curly, gray hair and finishing school manners. Born and raised near London, Betty has worked as a nurse, a professional singer, a new age lecturer, and a teacher of personal development. Her life has been rich and colorful. She is a good person to know if you want to see someone who's completely at home with her e. T. identity and if you want to hear the story of someone who became convinced of her celestial home not because of trauma, but through a startling moment of recall during hypnotic regression. When I spoke with Betty, she mentioned to me in the most casual manner that she was from Antares in the constellation Scorpio. She had arrived at this realization as a child, she said, when she also had the power to speak with nature spirits, read auras, stride great distances rapidly, and regulate her body temperature. Most of those practices, by the way, are a recognized part of Tibetan Buddhist mysticism. This was very interesting to me because I had long studied Buddhism and spent time in several monasteries. Here was the convergence of Eastern religion and E.T. awareness. Over the years, Betty says, her paranormal powers have lessened, but not before they so enriched her life that her metaphysical core has continually become much stronger. It wasn't so important that she lost the use of such powers, since their real effect was to indelibly impress her with the untapped potential of the human mind. She knew the amazing power is latent within all of us. And Betty, as she'll happily tell you, is a walk-in. She realized this only later, with the help of a hypnotherapist who helped her regress to the age of six. During that important year, which Betty relived in the therapist's office, she fell seriously and frighteningly ill with food poisoning that was complicated by mastoiditis, a serious infection of the inner ear. In the 1930s the treatment for this disease was not as sophisticated as it is today, and Betty's parents were told to expect the worst. Officially, that is exactly what happened. Bedridden and near death, the child Betty was finally pronounced clinically dead. For several minutes, to the attending doctor and fearful family members surrounding her bed, she was thought to have ended her natural life. A mournful silence began to enshroud the room. I'm sorry, the doctor said professionally. Oh, she's coming back, said Betty's mother, smiling. The doctor appeared astounded. What do you mean? He asked. I can see her, her mother said. I have a vision of her standing on the other side of a big river and she's talking to a being all dressed in white. And I know she's going to decide to come back. The doctor, understandably, was not persuaded. A few minutes later, however, the body stirred and Betty came alive once again. Her mother's prediction had been on the mark. During one of the hypnotherapy sessions when Betty was in deep regression, many years afterward, she suddenly remembered the exact details of this illness. She started telling her therapist, and that woman over there is not my mother. Well, what do you mean? The therapist inquired. You're speaking about your blood relatives? Were you adopted? Right double quotation mark. No, Betty said. Well, what are you saying? It was then that Betty recalled her walk-in, and as a testament to that experience, she exclaimed, My real mother is Astrid. Both Betty and the therapist were shocked. Who is Astrid? Actually, this was only one piece in the puzzle Betty solved so early in her life. She learned that Astrid was her mother in the E. T. Society that was her true home. When I interviewed her, Betty told me she's altogether comfortable with her identity as an extraterrestrial and regularly visits her home planet in sleep, during dreams that take her back to the constellation Scorpio. Hers is a life in which the mystical has always been present, 
so it's not surprising that she is so casual about matters that would astound and confound most other people. Catastrophic illness was the touchstone for Betty's E. T. experience. And whatever term we use to describe what really happened during that time, hallucination, fantasy, dream, or genuine walk-in soul transfer, it was a real experience that was incorporated into Betty's life. It changed her forever. A personal event, it eventually led to Betty seeing Betty in a completely different way. And it was something she could never prove to anyone but herself. There was no way to argue its reality. And in any case, she had no interest in proving it. Kristen, Soren, and Bob also experienced their awakenings and transformations after periods of overwhelming, seemingly insurmountable, difficulties. Life and death. Death and rebirth. The end of an old way. And the beginning of a new cycle. But that's not what always happens. For Pauline, life was going smoothly. She'd never been interested in New Age ideas and hurry. T. Awakening was entirely unexpected. When I spoke with her, Pauline described the event in language that you'd recognize from any standard psychology textbook. Her transformation, she told me in a furtive but very precise manner, resulted from a subtle interplay between forces conscious and unconscious. Pauline believes she was led by her inner process, and she was most careful not to label what had happened. That might end up to be misleading. She also felt it wasn't necessary to determine absolutely exactly what it was all about. Interestingly, the fact that it had truly happened, and changed her life for the better, was much more important to her than how it had happened. Many of those I interviewed would concur with such priorities. And in the story of Pauline, the vehicle of transformation didn't seem like a soul transfer, but more a strange and sudden influx of information, an information transfer, perhaps, and one that completely altered her life. Only later did she realize it had been part of a larger soul exchange experience. Pauline is a thin, attractive woman in her early 40s who at the time of her walk-in in 1979 was running a successful jewelry business in California. Without warning, she began having a series of paranormal experiences. At night, she would experience tremendous surges of energy every time she lay down in bed, but the phenomenon would cease. Each time she sat up. This went on for several months until one night, as in several previously mentioned cases with other E. T. S., she seemed to actually leave her body. She entered a strange non-physical state of incredible bliss and happiness. The experience, however, left her terribly confused. And several weeks later something very surprising occurred. Pauline had never missed a day of work, but on that morning she awoke from a deep sleep, dressed herself in casual clothes, and instead of heading off to her jewelry business as usual, she called in sick. Then, she marched out to her backyard, pulled up a comfortable chair, and proceeded for the next six hours to audio-tape an entire two-day seminar on the subject of inner focus. Which was really odd because Pauline wasn't scheduled to give any kind of seminar. In fact, she had no teaching experience at all. She was, in fact, shy and self-conscious about her speaking voice. Also, she knew nothing about the spiritual, esoteric healing ideas that she was including in her talk. What in the world, or out of the world, was happening? Not long after that startling morning, Pauline experienced another energy shift. Once again, she lay in bed amazed at what was going on. This time, however, there was something added. Clearly, distinctly, she heard a voice telling her, you are being healed. And this was bizarre, too, because not only was Pauline unaccustomed to hearing disembodied voices, she wasn't even aware that she needed any kind of healing. I felt fine, she told me. Healing. For what? Pauline then began a long period of research and personal reflection and finally sought out a series of spiritual teachers. When I interviewed her, she had at last come to terms with these strange experiences, and the terms were unique and very much characteristic of Pauline. Reflecting upon these bizarre occurrences of more than a decade ago, Pauline told me she now believes a presence entered my old personality patterns and changed them. And while she thinks she's a walk-in, she doesn't pretend to be entirely certain. Pauline, however, has at last become a spiritual teacher in her own right and says she will go anywhere she feels she's needed to support another person's growth. She's finally come into harmony with the original impulse that guided her to channel and transcribe her seminar on inner focus. Which leads us to a final question in our examination of E. T. Awakening. Having had these experiences, extraordinary dreams, strange voices, energy shifts, paranormal powers, out-of-body travel, visitations, 
How does one ultimately come to the conclusion of extraterrestrial identity? How does one arrive at this most unusual of statements about oneself? My world and welcome to ITA writer, therapist, and organizer of New Age seminars, Losha had still never believed she would have a walk-in experience herself. She knew what it was all about, but never imagined it had anything to do with her. In 1989, in her mid-thirties, Lucia, or Charlotte as she was then called, was preparing to host a workshop at her home given by a group of E.T. facilitators from Sedona, Arizona. These teachers, previously of the E.T. Earth Mission Group, are somewhat controversial as leaders who guide and assist those claiming non-earthly identity, in particular, walk-ins. Lucia was in the shower that morning when a voice, seemingly in her head, suddenly told her, you are going to have a walk-in experience today. Then, for hours afterward, she actually kept hearing the phrase, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Although, as she told me, it seemed kind of kitschy, an advertising slogan being used to impart spiritual guidance, this was indeed the message she received so clearly. Then, as suddenly as it began, it ended. There was a silence. Soon, however, the voice started to give what Lucia described to me as a moment of inner guidance, instructing her to drive to a nearby field, sit down, and rest. Feeling safe and protected, Lucia did as she was told. While she sat there idly picking at the grass, almost lost in astonishment, she felt a tremendous overshadowing presence in the sensation of upheaval, as if all of the energy was leaving her body, making way for new energy to enter. She felt that there was a new spirit entering her. And just as she was getting used to it, the spirit actually announced itself, using her body and her voice, and said, Damn, Texha W.A.A. Which was not her given name at the time. For three weeks after this, Lucia reported, she was graced with a radiantly clear mind, definite telepathic powers, and certainty about her origins as an E. T. And her purpose for being on Earth. Like Bob and Kristen, she was in a state of grace. But that didn't last. As with many walk-ins, these power faded rapidly, although the experience became a foundation, central and defining. During our interview, Lucia spoke of herself as an E. T. But also said she's open to the idea that all of my ideas about myself are false. It's even possible, she went on, that a delusive negative entity was toying with her, tempting her with the glamorous illusion of being a T. I was impressed with her open mindedness. Like Pauline, she was a non dogmatic teacher. E. T. Or not E. T. Comma, that was not the question. Nor was it the answer from most of those I interviewed. Recognizing themselves as E. T. Souls was only the end of one chapter and the beginning of another. For the others, as well as for Lucia, identification as an extraterrestrial was known finally in much the same way as any other identity is known, by self-validation. They all came to validate this conclusion on their own. What was crucial was not the declaration of being from elsewhere. As with any other declaration of selfhood, the most important factor was the degree of psychological integration. It finally became real when it was an insight that became a part of themselves, and when it had, it improved and enriched the quality of their lives. This is true for every one of them. Wanderers, E. T. S. from birth who come to self-understanding only gradually, were less in need of outside support or validation. There was no need to prove their identity to anyone. They eventually came to a deep, inner knowing of who they were. It confirmed what they had always suspected and wasn't much of a surprise. Walk-ins, who underwent a transformation suddenly and in the midst of earthly life, seemed more likely to require some help. It was not unusual for walk-ins to declare a non-earthly soul transfer while remaining open to some other explanation. The whole experience was often so baffling that a dogmatic conclusion was impossible. The very basis for their sense of self had been shifted and rearranged. Bob, the E. T. Who ended more than two decades of drug addiction when he experienced his walk-in, will today still comment, I can feel real neurotic sometimes. And as we've said, he identifies himself as Bob and not Bob, an identity confusion that is common among walk-ins who've recently undergone their strange metamorphosis. Peter, the architect who witnessed intelligent balls of light, is no longer confused about a Z. T. Identity but does make a clear distinction between the old personality and the new personality. I had to smile at Peter's understanding of what transpired because he wondered if maybe he had a walk-in without a walk-out. That last one, by the way, is not a common term. Comma, apparently Peter feels that his old human soul remained alongside a Z. 
T. Transfer, but he, unlike Bob, did not talk about himself as feeling neurotic. Right double quotation mark. What's also interesting is this, the overwhelming majority of those I interviewed did not stress the importance of their e. T. Status and did not generally think of themselves as aliens. Perhaps this was most succinctly stated by a woman, L.L. Call Linda, who lectures internationally on the role of walk-ins in society. Linda is counselor, author, and leader of a spiritual community in Oklahoma. She's one of the most practical and grounded of Thosa I met. Linda says she had a walk-in experience several years ago and definitely knows herself to be from Sirius. However, she never stresses this in her presentations. Instead, she says, being from elsewhere is just a piece of information. Linda says the walk-in experience allows a person to face their own foolishness. That foolishness, she says, is the imprisoning belief that a time-space identity is so very important after all. She says that what we really are is not the personality, what we really are is an embodiment of the absolute divine totality. This is a lot more freeing than the notion of being either an earth human or an E.T. Alien and is away with the notion that anyone is more holy than anyone else. We are all holy. Whether as wanderer or walk-in, Linda says that E.T. Identity opens up an experience that's really available to all humanity. It is the experience of being united with the cosmos, of being a brilliant thread in the universal tapestry of all. Subjective knowing, proof of A. Identity. W-H-O-A-M-I. W-H-O-R-W-E. New age, old view. If we're actually going to come face to face with the reality of extraterrestrial beings, we must first open our minds to a new view of reality itself. This is neither easily said, nor easily done. It might help to start this part of our journey with a quote from the scientist and dolphin researcher John Cunningham Lilly. The attempt to define all mystical, transcendental, and ecstatic experiences which do not fit in with the categories of consensus reality as psychotic is conceptually limiting and comes from a timidity which is not seemly for the honest, open-minded explorer. For our purposes, this kind of openness is even more important because the initial experience of walk-ins and wanderers, mystical, transcendental, or ecstatic, leads to a discovery that is worlds away from ordinary thinking. It also leads to questions of verification. One might go along with the reality of a transcendental experience, but to be led by that experience to the conclusion that one is an extraterrestrial soul? It's understandable that those around you might ask for ID at the door. Verification of, or proving, extraterrestrial identity plunges us directly into the heart of a central question of existence, anyone's existence, regardless of which planet they call home. With a discussion of verification, we're headed into a basic philosophical maze, not only into who we are, but also into how we know who we are. It's an inquiry that, when taken seriously, can upend our trust in common everyday reality as surely as the experience of an E. T. Walk-in. As the Zen philosopher Alan Watts once wrote, trying to define yourself is like trying to bite your own teeth. I've used the Watts quotation here because it holds a lot of wisdom, but I'd like to offer one slight amendment. We might enrich the kernel of truth in his words by talking this phrase onto the end of it, and yet. It is because, in some ways, this slippery attempt at self-definition, this biting our own teeth, is exactly what all of us are redoing every moment of every day, all the time, whether e. T or John? No. Every aspect of our reflexive, unthinking day-to-day -day living, even down to our most minor actions, is always being lived inside this ebb and flow. It's a tide formed by the question, who am I? And each of us must go on asking, and answering, this inquiry from moment to moment. Even without referring to extraordinary reality, we're forever redefining ourselves. And yet, we almost never stop long enough to consider who it is, or what it is, that's the seed of such constant experience. We usually don't pause to look back at the eye who partakes of all the richness and color of basic experience. When it comes to verification, proving that this is who I really am, a person who claims ordinary, everyday identity will have exactly the same difficulty proving who he or she is as someone who announces he or she's e. T. Except for our unquestioning reliance on the ideas, narratives, and documents that are commonly accepted as real by the powers that be. Namely, the external, social world. Caught naked, without any solid proof of identity, John Smith will be able to prove he's John Smith only as long as he can call for outside help, find the proper documents, or have someone else vouch for him. He's okay up until the moment he steps over a socially agreed-upon line. After that, 
he's in big trouble. And, what if, one day, the question who am I, suddenly gets answered by a truly radical claim, I'm a wanderer, or, I'm a walkin'? How does one go about proving such a statement, something which, in the everyday world, sounds unstable, illogical, and downright bizarre? And how can one ever be sure? The only way to gain certainty is through a process called, subjective knowing. I use this phrase to introduce an entirely different way of thinking and feeling, one that often makes many people uncomfortable. Subjective knowing is a process that allows us to know something for ourselves and by ourselves, without assurance from the outside world. We validate our own ideas without empirical proof. Subjective knowing connects us to a more personal reality. This is more the same as the statement that no proof is needed or if you think it's so, it is so. It is more an invitation for anyone to mockingly assume an outrageous identity with which they've truthfully never connected. In subjective knowing we use ourselves in a manner that's closer to the way of the artist, actor, writer, or musician and farther from that style of thinking that makes us prosecutors at our own trial with our every idea and feeling placed in the dock for judgment. What wanderers and walk-ins are for us is much more than the statement we are from elsewhere. They hope to be catalysts for a global renaissance of spiritual values and greater awareness. What sets their message apart from traditional religions is their acceptance of the possibility of many roads to heaven, many paths to spiritual development. As always, the key to such growth is greater. Attunement to the quiet voice within. Listening to, and then wisely following the dictates of your inner self is the complete opposite of the tendency to follow expert pronouncements and external authorities. Unfortunately, many of us renounce some or all of our personal responsibility and trade our own vision for a moment of security. In that way, we lose our precious powers of inner guidance. The pervasive social game in which we blithely follow the leader almost always brings disastrous results. Very few people are even aware they do this, and fewer still recognize the tremendous wisdom of the individual human soul. Therefore, it becomes necessary to chance a step into another way of viewing reality, a way that often differs from that of parents, teachers, bosses, and what passes for conventional wisdom. One possible starting place for this broader view is outlined by the Zen philosopher D. T. Suzuki, in his fine compilation The Essentials of Zen Buddhism, as for reality, it must be taken with naked hands, not with the gloves of language, idealization, abstraction, or conceptualization. Reality can be handled only by reality. This means we must put away completely all our beautiful structures, philosophical, theological or otherwise, at least for a while. Dressing ourselves is all right, but then we became too conscious of something other than ourselves, I mean our surroundings. No. Objection is made to social-mindedness, but rather to our becoming controlled and enslaved by those exterior things. The E. T. S. I. interviewed Hope to help us not by proving their reality, I. E. Comma, not by petitioning their UFO brethren to land on the White House lawn, but by offering their ideas. By this perspective. The process is the purpose. The journey of our lives is the point of our lives. The journey itself is the point, the orientation of mind that seeks to learn from our every experience. By the friction of daily interaction, by the veil that shrouds certainty, by the insistent human drive to understand, we're led onward to greater awareness. And in this process, the vehicle is as it has always been, subjective knowing. This is the great work of turning within, the central point of all esoteric traditions. It is no less than our lifeline to immortality and the meaning of our lives. It is also the central boulevard to the worlds of walk-ins and wanderers. When you've read or heard something and, through a mysterious inner process, come to know it for yourself, this is an example of subjective knowing in action. All of us use this process to a great extent, no matter how rational we think we are. Indeed, one definition of mental illness is the inability to validate anything within ourselves, which leaves us in the dark field of confusion. But, what if one day you ask yourself the question who am I? And it's answered in an unexpected manner, I'm extraterrestrial. The first time someone encounters this kind of otherworldly, extraordinary, or even outlandish idea, the most common reaction is to pull back and stay safely away from serious investigation. If that's how we've responded to questions of E.T. Identity, then. Our reaction to this answer will be amusement, perhaps, or even contempt. At the other end of the spectrum, we might allow the accused to get away with a light sentence using the insanity defense, anybody who honestly believes that they're an extraterrestrial is so radically breaking away from mainstream thinking that the person is almost certain to be crazy. 
our judgment of craziness, of course, will be handed down only after we've asked a wanderer or walk-in to prove himself by some kind of demeaning magic trick. If you're really an E. T. Comma, then dematerialize. Read my mind. Show me your spaceship. It's a common approach, and no more than a form of ridicule and bullying. It's also an outlook that badly mixes up the everyday world with the world of spirit, one that shows just how much we tend to use the wrong tools for the wrong purposes. Does such close-minded taunting really help us? I don't think so. It keeps us protected, happy to be on the outside of the question, and in control, where it's only possible to learn about the mundane view that we already hold, and never to venture anywhere new. The entire question of identity is usually handled in this kind of simple, concrete manner. Identity is seen as a driver's license that never needs renewing, it's assumed to be fixed and unchanging. Our nationality or our job, our race or religion, these are the normal ID cards proving who we are. The proof offered here is only what the outside, social world will accept. Sadly, it is the jury of our peers that is given final say as to who we are allowed to be. And I wouldn't be surprised if we could trace this behavior back to our ancestors. It's very possibly a holdover from the age of tribes and animal packs, when the individual was merely a unit of the group instead of a distinct, individuated whole. A uniform proves you're a policeman, a diploma proves you're a doctor, and so on. No one needs to recount the number of deadly wars fought throughout history in which the spark that cost millions of lives was ignited by nothing more than a supposed threat to national identity. And we've all heard too many tales of friends who've been thrown into terrible, painful crises that rattle the very roots of their self-worth after they've lost a job or suffered a financial setback. Their identities were bound up in external objects. Those who believe they are extraterrestrial souls, however, are dealing with a claim so shocking to our deeply held preconceptions that it upsets everything we know about the world. Empirical proof. If one of our e. T. S. did dematerialize in front of her critics, or suddenly sprout antennae, most of the skeptics would swiftly rationalize and just continue on with their doubting. Empirical proof is impossible because it would never be accepted. Such is the hold that comfortable, everyday reality has on us, it affords a protection we feel we can hardly do without. The E. T. S. say we can do better than that. Along our path, we'll go much farther when we jettison this one common mistake, we think we already know the nature of reality. We'll learn a lot more if we stop pretending to have a superior vantage point or a final answer. The experience of identity is too rich to be discussed within the narrow borders of coldly linear thought, simple logic, or with a secret, unspoken agenda that merely supports our own disbelief. Perhaps the best place to start is with the understanding nay. We really don't know how the universe works. Yet, we can get to the inside in the way an actor or writer creates a character. We can feel our way into the hearts and minds of those who claim a more cosmic experience, and do our best to understand the implications of what they are saying, not just their words, but rather the meaning they hold for our lives. All it requires is that we employ the amazing resources of the imagination. In that way, even the most committed skeptic might walk away with his rejection still safe and sound, but having learned something nonetheless. The E. T. S. themselves counsel just such an approach. They also recognize the very intimate nature of self-validation and the fact that it is only by subjective knowing that each of us can arrive at a more integrated, comprehensive view of reality. For the benevolent ones, who seek to aid our personal growth, they confine themselves to offering us catalyst, grist for the mill, bits and pieces of mystery, like crop circles, that inspire our deepest aspirations. As one of the Confederation members stated during a channeling session, we offer them, Earth people, no concrete proof, as they have a way of expressing it. We offer them truth. This is an important function of our mission, to offer truth without proof. In this way, the motivation will, in each and every case, come from within the individual. In this way, the individual vibratory rate will be increased. An offering of proof or an impressing of this truth upon an individual in such a way that he would be forced to accept it, would have no usable effect upon his vibratory rate. This, then, my friends, is the mystery of our way of approaching your peoples. Italics added. Which is to say, the benevolent E. T. S. treat us as adults. Without forcing upon us a set of new paradigms, they appear in ways that simply catch our curiosity. And for those ready to uncover hidden truth, the tools are provided to turn over every boulder in our path. I know I don't know. 
Now that we realize our journey must be traveled alone, perhaps we can more closely examine some of the scenery through which we find ourselves wandering. We're dealing here with people who've undergone an extraordinary experience of awakening after a death of their old identity. All of them have come to espouse some concepts that had been altogether alien to them before their new sense of self took hold. The psychologist Stanislav Grof spoke in detail about a similar process during a conversation with physicist Fritz Joff Capra that Capra includes in his book, Uncommon Wisdom, The Complete Death Rebirth Process Always Represents a Spiritual Opening. People who go through that experience invariably appreciate the spiritual dimension of existence as being extremely important, if not fundamental. And at the same time their image of the physical universe changes. People lose their feeling of separateness, they stop thinking of solid matter and begin to think of energy patterns. And Groff goes on to say that consciousness can be seen as something primordial, which cannot be explained on the basis of anything else, something that is just there and which, ultimately, is the only reality, something that is manifest in I, you and me and in everything around us. Subjective knowing is the only way to validate such awareness. Paradoxically, sometimes this process leads to subjective unknowing or a greater uncertainty as to what really is and is not. In speaking about her current walk in awareness, which came to her first as an internal voice while she was showering, Lucia told me, it's a constant experience. It feels like I'm on the wrong planet at the wrong time. It's a constant inner voice. Like most of the E. T. S. I interviewed, Lucia said there was no one, single moment when she was suddenly and irrevocably certain that she was an extraterrestrial. The final identity shift took place gradually, over time, and was accompanied by a feeling of inner knowing. But it was such a huge awakening to myself, she went on, that it felt like a different life stream. No absolute certainty about who she is, maybe, but what I found most interesting when I spoke with Lucia was something else I'd heard from a number of those who claimed to be from elsewhere, there seemed to be very little need for such absolute certainty. In fact, as I put on my professional role as the impartial researcher, I think I sounded more concerned about it than they did. After I de-asked Lucia several times about how she could be certain, she finally said, in something so subjective, I would never say I'm 100% sure. But I wouldn't say that I'm 100% sure of anything. I said to her, well, as someone who does therapy and counseling with people claiming to be from elsewhere, don't you have to eventually ask them, are you sure? It's different than that, Lucia said, it's more subtle. Her advice to anyone on the verge of claiming a T. Identity wasn't you better prove it now. Instead she counseled others to, look deeply into yourself and determine your motives. How strongly do you really feel this new identity? Can you live like this? And, if so, how is it going to feel to live your life on earth with this radically misunderstood sense of self? Misunderstood by society, that is. Comma, I heard the same kind of subjective unknowing when I spoke with Bob. He, too stressed the importance of process, the process of continually coming to grips with radical conceptions of self that at a very deep level feel right. Bob told me that his own personal acceptance of being from elsewhere took place over several years, and that nothing clinched it for him, even now, he said, I'm still growing. I had to smile when he finished by confessing, actually, I consider myself to be normal. Or as normal as you can be in this society. But, for the purposes of the interview I acted as though I knew very little about what he meant, and so I put to Bob the same question that I asked Lucia. I kept returning to it, pressing for an answer, because it's certainly an interesting point, how could he have had this extraordinary series of experiences without anything coming along to validate it for him, to clinch it, as he said. I asked, hasn't that been difficult? Not at all, Bob answered with the nonchalance I'd heard so often from E. T. S. The issue of being an E.T. Soul or not isn't such a big deal. At first, he said, right after the walk-in, some kind of definite closure had been important, but through time, as I got more balanced, I got comfortable with a lack of closure. Now, identity is just an ongoing process. It's a way of exploring life. I've reached a point, Bob concluded, where I'm all right with whatever it is. I'm comfortable with the way I am, no matter what which could be taken as a statement of psychological maturity whether or not the person believes in E, T, S or distant home planets. I put some of these same questions to Yuna. She's a visual artist, a very childlike woman in her mid-fifties who paints, draws, and lives a kind of idyllic country life with what she calls a special connection to plants and animals. When I asked her what it was, exactly, 
that pinned down her identity for her, she answered, Hey, it's not like a big boom. Or anything, it's a series of things. Changing perception is one of them. I view the world very differently now. But there was a lot of doubt. For a long time and that only cleared up gradually. There wasn't any one moment where I woke up and said, Yeah. This is it. Eventually, Yuna said, she talked about her feelings with a co-worker who had been through a similar experience and that, at least, gave her the feeling that she wasn't crazy, that there was a framework in which to understand what she was going through. But ultimately, Yuna said, despite any help from elsewhere or anywhere, it's self-validation, the willingness to trust and live with your own experience regardless of who else agrees or disagrees, that becomes the key to anyone's identity. And although many of us in the United States enjoy our share of blood, sweat, and tears when we set about the grim task of self-development, it may be that self-validation is just an academic way to talk about a process that's completely natural and happening all the time. It might be a process that we can hamper by trying too hard, a process of letting go, being with yourself, accepting yourself, or in the old Taoist formula, the effortless work of non-doing. Self-validation is simply opening the door when you yourself are knocking. As Yuna told me, people grow in spiritual awareness so it's natural that more and more of their insight becomes affirmed. All aims become more inner-directed. Self-validation is going on even if you don't know about it or don't know how to talk about it. Right double quotation mark. And through this fundamental means, we become more and more conscious. You're not lying, I just don't believe you. Then, there's the case of Vicky. What do you do when people say you're crazy? I asked her. I just laugh, she said, laughing. It doesn't disturb me at all because I know what I know. I'm very comfortable with my ideas. Also, I can laugh at myself and I can tease them. If you can laugh at yourself, then you're not that crazy. Usually. Vicky, you may remember, breezed through one of the most peaceful, uneventful awakenings I've ever heard about. She's an extremely attractive woman in her late thirties. Small and thin, with dark features and a teasing, sly manner, Vicky keeps herself in excellent physical condition. She is from North Carolina and runs her own business specializing in about 20 different kinds of body work and body therapy as well as in color and sound therapies. Of all the people I spoke with who claimed to be from elsewhere, Vicky was the most visibly at ease with her e.t. roots, at times, she was positively vivacious about it. Most people, once you talk with them, she said, are fascinated. They may not agree, but they feel a certain power, a certain sureness, a certain energy that pulls them in. So, a lot of people have told me, I know you're not lying but I don't necessarily believe you. But Vicky's self-confidence combined with her sense of service means that getting people to agree with her isn't of the utmost importance. If I have any goal in my life with people, it's to help them remove the blinders from themselves. They don't have to agree with me. But if they push their boundaries and minds and hearts out a little bit, then I believe I've done them a service. So I have a little bit of a rebellious side that way. I'm kind of an extraterrestrial brat. It's important, Vicky said, not to camouflage yourself. Especially from your own inner vision. And she feels that she never has, although I have plenty of things to work on, as we all do, I try to speak the truth, regardless of what happens. For Vicky, it's never a matter of truth or consequences, it's a matter of truth and consequences. It's worthwhile, I think to go into some detail with Vicky's story because her self-assured attitude toward non-traditional identity is so full of light and cheer and encompasses so many positive ways of seeing, that I feel she serves as a good example. And as Vicky herself said to me, that's the best way to teach, by example. From one angle, what I understood Vicky to be saying all through our interview was that there's really no need for big, traumatic scenes, or dramatic claims when we're dealing with universal ideas. There's a big difference between true feeling and sentiment or dramatic emotion, she said. I'm pretty good at balancing the head and heart. And, of course, there's a lot of exaggeration in spiritual affairs, I've heard quite a bit of it myself. But Vicky seemed to be saying that much of the sci-fi drama created around E. T. Identity is really only a false front, constructed by people who hope to gain glamour or popularity. You have to be careful not to succumb to the temptation of glamour, she said because it can drown out what's truly important. There are pivotal events, wonderings, and questions in our lives that hold the key to a new phase of learning and self-expression. What's crucial, Vicky believes, is learning to listen to what she terms the triggers in yourself and then continuing the journey on your own. In Vicky's life, 
Continuing this journey on her own eventually meant moving into realms of serious study, working to master new ways of helping people. She became acquainted with a variety of body therapies, began voraciously reading spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric literature. She bought and read two books a week, she said, until she'd built up quite a library, and, finally, she started speaking with those who had first-hand knowledge of cosmic truths. Vicky was so accepting of her wonder origins that her self-study became like an incredibly exciting journey. She described it as a path to regaining her extraterrestrial vision, the native powers and wisdom that she'd lost by incarnating on Earth. These were very focused efforts, backed up by concentrated work, and the process allowed Vicky to move beyond boundaries she would have never thought possible. Increasingly, she was comfortable traveling between worlds. In fact, Vicky said, 15 years before, when she first started paying attention to the inner triggers that whispered from elsewhere, she hadn't done any reading on E.T.S. or UFOs and wasn't even a big fan of science fiction. And, as is often the case, one of the most vivid triggers was a dream. Before that night, Vicky had always slept soundly, hardly ever remembering her dreams. Yet, that evening, and on the next two nights, she had exactly the same dream and it always ended in exactly the same place. Vicky called these lucid dreams because she believes them to be objective experiences that took place in a different psychic reality. They were not, she cautioned, happening in the ordinary physical universe that we know, like the claims made for UFO abductions. She considered their locale to be spiritual, a more subtle plane of the Earth itself, yet used as symbolic communication from her higher self. The dream took place in the house in which Vicky was raised. She was alone in front of a huge picture window when suddenly, the ground began rumbling and shaking and she called out, addressing a question to the earth itself, what is going on? The earth replied, be prepared for the visit. Vicky didn't understand. She didn't have much time to think about it, though, because a strange, whirring sound started and through the picture window she saw a spaceship land right on the lawn of her front yard. Concerned, but not frightened, Vicky grabbed her car keys and bolted for the front door, but when she got outside she saw that her car had been dematerialized. After that, she ran for a hill near her house and began climbing. At the top, where she could peer over, she spotted another house and two beings she calls female humanoids wearing Onipi's suits walking toward her. One of these beings was carrying a bag of something, some kind of seed-like material that she kept tossing around in the grass as if gardening. Vicky again asked the Earth, what is she doing? The Earth replied, an experiment. And at that, Vicky says, she became very indignant, thinking, how dare she? At which point, the humanoids spied Vicky. They approached her. They came up the other side of the hill and stood before her. Then, Vicky says, something remarkable happened. She suddenly understood what it was like to be inside three bodies simultaneously, her physical body, which she knew to be frozen, her mental body, which was warning her that the humanoids were trying to hypnotize her, and her spiritual body, which raised her physical hand and intoned, in the name of the one, you can do me no harm because I am of the light. With that declaration, says Vicky, bolts of illumination shot out of her hands and flashed into the head of the humanoid, who was completely dazed. Vicky then took charge. Telepathically, she said to her visitors, now that that's out of the way, how is it I can serve you and what is it that you want? The answer was, you have just changed my reason for coming. There are things that I may now show you that you may share with your people. Hearing this pronouncement, Vicky felt her sentiments shift and became very protective concerned that the humanoids would be discovered. The earthlings, she feared, would react with such shock and terror that they'd attack the humanoids, injure or kill them. She ushered both of the visitors into her house. They began trying to share their information. However, as they did so, Vicky began to run wildly around the room shouting, you can't talk with me until I find a tape recorder. And at that moment, she was awakened. Each time, on all three consecutive nights. In that very same place. Not only that, but on the first morning, Vicky was rocked awake by her clock radio going off and a DJ's voice raucously, laughing about how people must have been partying last night because we've had three reports of UFOs. On the second morning, she awakened a half hour earlier, again to the clock radio alarm, and this time she heard a talk show discussing government censorship of UFO documents. On the third morning she woke up because of a phone call from a girlfriend in Hawaii, which came, as always, at the very same point in the dream narrative, the friend told her how an acquaintance had been taken aboard a spacecraft. That event, said her girlfriend, 
had given her a sudden urge to call Vicky. As I listened to Vicky relate her story, I couldn't help thinking that this was quite a tale, and I told her exactly that. In Jungian terms, we could say she'd had a big dream, meaning a definite message from the self. Indeed, it was Jung who described doing therapy as joining with a patient to address the two-million-year-old man who is in everyone, it was Jung who believed that our greatest difficulties come from losing contact with our own ancient knowledge. This is not so different from the way Vicky understood the message she was being given in her dream. It was the trigger, and I paid attention to it. The funny thing is, she said with a smile, that I don't really care very much about the actual physical phenomenon of UFOs. But I do have a kind of knowingness about things. I'm almost never surprised, because when things like this happen to me it feels like I somehow already knew about them. They already exist in my worldview. When Vicky told her family, her birth family, about what had happened and her take on it, she said everyone was very supportive. She described her family as very tight and very honest, saying that she never felt forced to hide anything and that there were never any secrets about her burgeoning interests, or what she does for a living, or how she identifies herself. Both my stepfather and my real father think I'm a little out there, she left, but they don't mind. And my mother is incredibly psychic, so she's right out of there with me. Right double quotation mark. No regrets. The teenager who grew up to be Vicky definitely did not have her eyes on the stars or her head in the clouds. And she probably never considered that her adulthood might be so out of the ordinary, dedicated to universal service, as Vicky says. But now that she's here among us, has she realized exactly where she's from? Does she call Earth her home? It's one of thousands of galaxies I've called home, Vicky said. And I hope no one takes that as a statement of simple, physical reality. In other words, she went on, it's possible to talk about incarnated souls or e.t. Souls that aren't coming from other planets but arrive instead from other tendencies, an entirely different type or level of reality. For instance, Vicky told me, she's long had a love for the idea of the Ashtar Command, a federation of extraplanetary civilizations under the supreme jurisdiction of Ashtar. Here, for the purposes of my survey, I let myself listen to Vicky like an outsider. When I asked her to go into her ideas in a little more detail, to explain more about the reality of Ashtar, our talk became as complicated as a discussion of the theological concept of God, not reality, not fantasy, maybe somewhere in between, if you feel it's necessary to measure its objectivity. And probably indescribable. So how are you going to be sure about that? Vicky laughed. Eventually, you begin to discern what you can be fairly sure of and what's forever going to be open. And I think one of the greatest sources of pain on this planet is people's lack of ability to discern. Finally, Vicky gave me one of the simplest conclusions I could imagine for a discussion of validating a person's e. t. identity, or any identity, and it was a statement that I was later to hear several times from several of the people I interviewed. It brought us right back to our original question, how do you really know? Ultimately, Vicky said, it doesn't matter whether someone is e. t. or not e. T. It just doesn't matter. They're still here, and they're still doing what they feel they've been put on Earth to do. Declaring yourself to be an E. T. Might give somebody comfort, it might give you greater understanding, but it's also not absolutely necessary, it doesn't affect the nouns. Well, then, I asked her. What do you think is important? To follow your heart, she answered. Moving in balance. Perfecting discernment. Speaking for yourself. And being brave. It was also important, she felt, to mention something else related to the question of validating a t identity. When people are skeptical of those who say they're from elsewhere, even when they themselves have had some deep experience, they're usually basing that doubt on very little information, if any at all. What most people know about being from elsewhere doesn't come from serious questioning, study, or self-discovery. It comes from popular movies, primetime TV, and the very fertile imaginations of novelists and screenwriters. Of course, the question could also be turned around. It's just as logical to ask, how do you know, really know, that you're not E. T. Vicky told me that if people go inside themselves and examine their hearts and then find they know, truly know that it is not so, that they are not E. T. Comma, well then, more power to them. Then it is not so for them, that's all. But to discuss an extraordinary possibility on flimsy evidence, namely the doubting Thomases of our sometimes too rational culture, is not only illogical, it's probably self-deceptive. Remember, 
The wanderer usually has a smoother path when it comes to being certain of extraordinary identity. The walk-in often gets thrown for a loop, not knowing am I from elsewhere or am I insane? What am I doing in this body? And sometimes, who is this husband? Who are these children? And quite often, this I is not real at all. But as I said before, even for a someone who basically identifies herself as a wanderer, Vicky showed an amazing degree of confidence in her beliefs and in her extraterrestrial identity. She exuded a powerful feeling that the exact nature of her identity ultimately didn't matter, and that came through in both her statements and her actions. You could tell she was speaking the truth by the definite look in her eyes. She felt that way and she acted that way, which takes an impressive effort of self-awareness and self-recognition. And with that, I'll give Vicky the last word, because the point of it all, E. T. Or not, is to live in joy and fulfillment, T. Feel firmly that I've agreed to it all, she said with a clear sense of recognition. It's total free will and I haven't regretted any of it. And that comes along with something else. The greatest attribute I now have is joy. Actually, I've always had an incredible feeling of the joy of life. Right double quotation mark. And that brings us to an end of the sample. The audiobook is at the end of page 53. Download the book and mp3 below. Thank you for joining Zara Her for a good sample of this book. Please check out the rest in the subscription and subscribe to my channel for more.